welcome to the Bald Truth Leadership Podcast, a place where you get straightforward, no-nonsense ideas on leadership and growth, both personally and professionally. Today, the Bald Truth Podcast is brought to you by the Peak Performance Group. I am your coach, host, <laughs> Coach Rick Colster, Certified Executive Business Coach and Chief Coaching Officer of the Peak Performance Group, where we help people and organizations align and maximize their potential. Today, folks, I got to tell you, I've got an amazing guest, one that I'm just excited to talk to. Today, our guest, he's got a long list of accomplishments, and this includes things like three Super Bowl wins, 46 combat missions, and an A-10 Warthog. How they fit him into that plane, I'll never know. Um, and as cool as that he's, he sounds already, I know, right? Really cool. He's also an author and a businessman as well as a leader of a movement that is changing the face of men and faith in the community and nationwide, folks. Um, he works his, in his, his work in his ministry has led him to be recognized not only as a powerful man of faith, but also an amazing husband and father. Today, it's an honor to welcome my dear friend, Chad Hennings. Chad, welcome to The Bald Truth. Rick, it is an honor and a privilege to be with you. So do I call you Rick or Coach? Either one, whatever works best for you. <laughs> okay, buddy. Just kidding. Nah, man, it's great to be on. Thanks for having me on. Oh, absolutely. It, you know, we've known each other a long time for, uh, from our, for our wingman days. I see you've got your representing this morning. I can see that. Amen. That and uh, just so folks know, wingman is, a, one of, is one of Chad's ministries. He's got a couple of things he's working on. I'll let him share with one of those. But it's been an amazing ministry over the last 16 or 17 years that I've been a part of it that has changed the lives of hundreds and hundreds of men. So um, let's start off and let's talk about, um, let's start with Zoom. That's something that is just crazy. Today. We're doing this via Zoom. How is this changing the way we connect with people? I mean, we've done the, our wingman sh meetings via Zoom now. So how is this changing how we connect with people? You know, it's, it's one thing that we as Americans do well. We, we, we innovate. We come up with great ideas. That's what freedom of thought and expression gives us the opportunity to do that. And I, you know, particularly from a connectivity piece that we all need to be a part of community. And then this time of isolation, self-isolation, Zoom has given us that opportunity to come together, to be able to visually, to see people, to connect with people. And, and we've done that with our our wingman ministry and what wingman basically is for your listeners. It's just, it's a ministry for men where we encourage discipleship, bring men together into community form of transparent Christ centered masculine relationships. So we've done that by bringing, you know, we have a live speaker, men can talk. They have their small group ministries that they get together with where they can laugh, they can have a good time and they can still have that opportunity to, to truly look guys eye in the eye, eye to eye. And, and have that piece of connectivity. And I've seen churches do this all over the nation where their membership, the number of eyeballs that, um, and the number of people that these churches are impacting sometimes are up a hundred percent, hundredfold over what uh, they normally would be in a normal period. So Zoom has given us this opportunity to stay connected. Um, it's the next best thing to actually being there. Well, you know, it's, it, that's so interesting you say that. Um, uh, our church, we did a businessman's prayer about a week ago, maybe four or five days ago. And we had 106 local small business owners that got on and our pastor brought in someone to speak and prayed for us. But it's in that quick hour. It was so interesting. And he mentioned this, that our church, while, and we've got a pretty good sized church over at Milestone Church over here in Keller and, uh, give a shout out for my church. And um, that we usually get says over Easter, and we just went through, you know, what is the, essentially the Super Bowl for churches, Easter. And um, he said, we would usually have 17, 18,000 people come through the five or six or seven services that we have normally on Easter. Via Zoom, they had 109,000 people tune in. So think about that for wingmen. How is that? How do you think this is going to help expand wingmen and your ministry there? You know, I'm, I'm really looking at because of this success that Zoom has had and how men are truly now are becoming more condi conditioned to that older guys, baby boomers, Generation X, 
Millennials, you they call are. Call me old. It. Wait a minute. Did you just call well, me old? I am with you, dude. I'm as I'm right there with you. So we collectively, we're in an age is a relative state of mind, which we can probably get mindset <laughs> we get into later too. But but because of that success, I really see an opportunity to bring men that are geographically separated, that are are isolated, and just quick sidebar. You know, we talk about this pandemic or this coronavirus, Wuhan virus, China virus, whatever you want to call it. But I think even before that, there has been a, an epidemic of isolated, of the isolated male, of men being stuck where they can't be, have those, form those relationships and be transparent and have relationships with other men where they can open up and, and share any chinks in their armor. But because of this, Zoom is going to be allow us, and I'm really thinking about expanding it through our, my ministry through Wingman, is to have virtual small groups that consistently can meet, where you have a guy from Philly meeting with a guy from Chicago, meeting a guy from Jacksonville, meeting with a guy from Dallas, where they truly can form those bonds. And I've seen the effectiveness of it, and I think Zoom is going to be here to stay. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I've I've been holding some podcasts, our leadership podcasts. Uh, all, all our podcasts are done, obviously, with Zoom, but also one of the things I'm doing is I'm holding the seminars now. Last week, every every day at three o'clock, I held a seminar for about eight days in a row. Just, you know, seven things leaders can do to get through these times. I've got another one coming up. So there's, there's a lot of opportunity out here as well. But, you know, I think I'd be remiss. I would be remiss if I didn't probe a little bit into some of your background. Now, You've obviously been real successful. You know, obviously played for the Cowboys, even though I'm a giant fan, I still love you. Um, and, you know, at Air Force Academy, all the things you've accomplished in your life. And it's obvious you've got a strong work ethic. I mean, it's, so where did this come from? And how can someone, maybe one of our listeners, one of the leaders that are listening today, how could they strengthen their drive or desire to succeed what what was that fire in your belly that where how did it start how did you get it and keep it i think you know there's there's it's not one thing there's so many different nuances to that for me my story is that i grew up on a farm and it was instilled in me it maybe have been uh, genetic <laughs> but when you watch your i watched my father my grandfather our family farm had grew up in Iowa, had been, has been in our family for 130, 140 plus years. Wow. And seeing your father, my father, my grandfather worked the land where there were days where they didn't feel well. You know, they, they, they uh, did maybe emotionally spent, but had to get up and nobody else was going to feed the livestock, feed the cattle. Nobody was going to go harvest the grain. Nobody's going to go do the field work that was required. You had to do it. And then that, I think, instilled in me this aspect of a work ethic to be, to perform because nobody's going to do it. It was up to you to get the job done. That translated well into my athletic career early, academically in school, that um, if you want to see success, it takes effort. It takes commitment. Like one of the books that I wrote uh, regarding that. And for me, one of the things that, that helped too, is I surrounded myself with individuals that pushed me, that challenged me. My parents instilled in me, uh, always preached and held me accountable to that aspect of commitment. You start something, you finish it. I uh, had an older brother who was a year and a half older that, you know, huge sibling rivalry, but he would drag me along to go do workouts. I think starting in the summer between my eighth grade and ninth grade year entering high school, where he said, come with me, we're going to work out. Like, I don't, you know, I don't want to, you know, him and Hod, but he drug me. And then I started to see success. I started to taste those little bits of success by doing the little things, blocking, tackling, doing the X's and O's of what it foundationally to establish that foundation. And I realized that man, hard work when you hard, it pays off. And I started to see success, you know, in the weight room initially, and then the athletic field on the wrestling mat, you know, on the basketball court, all these things. And, and the, it was surprise, surprise, the harder I worked, the more success I was able to achieve. Okay. But with that whole aspect, though, Rick, what I found later in life is that you, we, particularly as men, can follow that trap of performance, where that becomes your identity. And that's where I kind of fell into that trap that what I did was who I was. And whether that was a football player, fighter, pilot, you know, businessman, whatever, 
I soon realized because of certain trust in my, my life that I realized what I did didn't define who I was. So I realized, you know, from our individual faith, I work not to become saved, I work because I'm saved. And that's a whole part of my identity as to who I am as a man. And I realized that work ethic, great American work ethic, Protestant work ethic, whatever you want to call it, is great and essential in life, but it's not the end all. You know, it's interesting because there are three things that popped out to me as, as I'm listening here for, about you is, number one, make commitment, be able to make a commitment to yourself, to your life, to your God, make commitments and keep them. Number two is have an accountability partner. Have somebody, your brother, drug your butt to the gym, right? And then hard work. Those three things, I think, and you just nailed it for anyone that's out there that's listening and say, you know what? Make a commitment. Put your line in the sand. Draw that line in the sand. Find somebody to hold you accountable. And then get out and go put the work in. Put the effort in, and you're going to see the success in that. And I know you were, uh, weren't you a state champion wrestler, too, as well? Yeah. Yeah, yeah so it, and it, all that, play, that, that it works well for, for all of us for business owners or leaders within. And if you do that, those things will, you know, come true. Your dreams will come true, so to speak. And they're not dreams. They're just the result of hard work and effort. And, and realize too, that along the way, along the journey, you're going to come across the obstacles that you may have the inability to overcome. So, you know, it's that aspect of be your best self today, be the best you can today, encourage others to do the same. And in the organizations that you're affiliated with, whether that be your company, your church, your family, you know, you got to rise to a higher noble purpose or cause because it can't be about just you. You know, I, I was had a conversation with a group of young men today in a mentoring session that I did, and it was a whole aspect of identity. If your identity is purely wrapped around making money, it's not a vision statement. It's not, it's not a mission statement to have. It's got to be something beyond self. And that's where I go into, you know, Frankel's Man's Search for Meaning where what is your why? Why do you do what you do? You know, way okay. before Simon Sinek was talking about what's your why. You know, Frankel did it as well as, you know, the early, you know, Romans and Aristotle, the Greeks talked about, you know, what is your why? Why? Why do you do what you do? And that for me, identity wise, is, is the most important thing. Until you get that established, then commitment, then all those other traits uh, pile on top of that to make that a success. Actually, you know, when you mentioned, uh, we're talking about commitment, we're talking about accountability, we're talking about hard work, but you also mentioned that you've written a book or two, right? Or three. <laughs> three. I don't uh, know. Wow. I thought it was so, okay. So one of them was about character. And that's one of the things that I know about you is that you're this amazing man of character. And I have the ton of respect for that. But also, and I, I think I shared it with you, um, the effect that that has had on in people in the marketplace. So, what are your three? What are the titles of the three books so everyone can can know what they are, and then let's talk about them for a second. Okay, sure. First book I wrote was a book called "It Takes Commitment." That was back when I was playing with the Cowboys. It's a series of books that Multnomah put out um, on a biblical trait, and it was commitment. Um, then I did a book called "Rules of Engagement: Finding Faith and Purpose in a Disconnected World." That was a lot of lessons learned that I learned through ministry for doing wingman. I'm kind of, you know, I, I don't want to call it a game plan for life, but my experiences that I had on why it's important for both self-awareness, self-care, and then how to get out in the community and impact others. And then my okay. final book that I wrote was a compilation of conversations that I had with 10 people called Forces of Character. I wanted to set out to prove that character is a choice, that it's, um, anybody can, can do it, that it's agnostic, that, that it's, it's um, as I said, it's choice. So I, I interviewed 10 people, had conversations, 10 people that impacted me, you know, names of individuals you'd recognize from Troy Aikman, Roger Staubach, Jason Garrett, Greg Popovich, Justice Clarence Thomas, to individuals that um, you maybe not have heard of, but their stories were awesome, like survivors of Auschwitz, Ed Eager, as you and I both know, sure. too an astronaut, a survivor, uh, a human rights attorney from former communist Romania to the CEO for the National Center on Fathering and a homelessness expert. Male, female, black, white, I want to show that character is ubiquitous, that it doesn't matter your background, that it's a choice. And for me, that was probably my, my favorite book 
that I did because it's not necessarily my story, but it's other people's stories. But you can see that that success, that excellence, it's there is a certain pathway that truths that translate across the board, no matter your background, you can achieve excellence. And it's by being a force of character. See, and that's the one thing that, that I think is so critical when we talk about business owners and leaders is that piece, that character piece, not to be a character, but to have character, you know, cause we know, we all know a lot of characters in our world and, yeah. uh, yeah. but to have that character and that. So, so, okay. That, that, words lead me different ways. So you never know what's going to happen on the bald truth. Talk about characters. And this is something that popped into my head this morning as I was prepping for our call is some characters. Uh, and there's two that came to mind right away and talk about your cowboy days. And you can make this as quick or as short as you want, or as long and drawn out as you like. Um, two guys come to my mind right away. Actually a bunch, because during your Super Bowl run, you've got Troy Aikman, right? You've got Emmett. Michael and Dion too. So I've, I've met Emmett and I know him to be a quiet, conservative, nice guy, just a really nice guy. Um, we see Troy all the time. He seems like he's pretty straight, straight laced, but Michael Irvin and Dion, those guys, they got a little bit of the, uh, let's say press news got in the news, so to speak. Were they characters in the locker room? Were they as, as charismatic and, call it crazy in the locker room as they let the the public know, or is that just kind of a, a little bit of a show? No, Michael, uh, Michael is Michael. Michael is the same person that you see on TV that you see in the public eye as he was in the locker room in, in private. He's probably one of the hardest working individuals I've been around, very passionate, passionate to win and actually one of the most selfless individuals I've ever been around too in the fact that he would do whatever it took to win he wanted to win and he was a great teammate and uh, granted he wanted the ball because he wanted to compete but um but he had the triplets there on that side during those offense or those uh, Super Bowl run where you had Troy and you had Emmett so he, he had to kind of distribute the ball get the round that he couldn't be the limelight all the time but okay on Michael you know Michael battled his own demons too during that success run where it kind of got to uh his aspect of identity and i actually wrote about michael a part of it in one of my chapters in rules of engagement where michael one time spoke at a, a wingman event that we put on and he remembered growing up where he, people kept telling him all the time hey man you the man michael you the man and he saw what does it mean to be the man similar to what you know this environment of toxic masculinity and, and a lot of young people, young men are just struggling with today. What does it mean to be a man? We've lost that biblical definition of man. And in Michael's day, it was about, hey, how many ladies, how much money can you make? How much sure. glam, fortune, fame, worldly things can you achieve? That's what it meant to be the man. But he soon realized how fickle that was and how destructive that was. And it brought him back to his faith. Granted, you know, there are times where he struggled. We all struggle, and we all sin. We all fall short. But sure. uh, I respect Michael greatly, and he's been a big fan of what I do, what we do collectively with, with the Wingman sure. Ministry and, and reaching out to young men and to men to, to impact their lives. So Michael was a character, but um, he's finishing strong. Good. That's good. That's, that's awesome to hear. So, and, you know, one of the things that I know about you is giving back. And one of your your – I, one of, I think one of the most respected traits that I have of you is that you give back and you give, whether it's your ministry, whether it's your friends, your family, you give back and, and helping people and helping men specifically. Um, this is a passion. So what's some advice that you might want to give someone who's looking to give back? You know, what, what are some of the things that drove you to success, be successful in giving back? Because I'm sure a lot of us have failed in our opportunities that we've given back. That didn't go too good. What kind of ideas or what kind of advice would you give someone who says, you know what, maybe it's time to give back. This whole thing we're going on with COVID, man, is just, I'm seeing people now I'm waving to my neighbors. We walk, Brenda and I walk four miles a day and I'm waving to people and they're waving back or they're waving to me and I'm waving back. It's really interesting to see how this, whole shelter in place has changed our dynamics and our neighbors 
our friends. So how do we give back? You know, hey, who needs groceries? Who needs toilet paper? Who needs, um, name it, sanitizer, whatever it is right now. What's some advice you would give someone who says, you know, it's time to give back? You know, it goes back, to Rick, I'm gonna, I harp on this all the time when I, like you, when I do different speeches, it's, it's all about discovering identity. Identity is a choice. What is your identity? Who are you as an individual? And, and ask yourself that question, why? Why do you do what you do? I mean, are you giving back for what's the purpose? To serve others or is it to, um, to ingratiate yourself, to pat yourself on the back so social media, hey, look what I did. I served today at the North Texas Food Bank by handing out food and, and help packaging boxes for others in need. You know, why do you do what you do? Is there a purity aspect in that? And I go back to this aspect of, you know, for me personally, you alluded a little bit of my biography. I've been able to achieve a lot of different things in life. You know, two-time academic All-American, unanimous All-American, state champion wrestler, a Super Bowl champion, Air Force fighter pilot, but ultimately, so what? So what? My legacy, I firmly believe my legacy is not going to be defined by those things, by the amount of material possessions I've been able to accumulate or my accomplishments, nor the things that I've failed at, my, my setbacks in life. I truly believe that our legacy is going to be defined by relationships, those people that we've been able to impact in life. And for me, that's why I do what we do. So I would encourage anybody, yeah, find your passion. What's your passion? What do you want to get involved with? As you know, we talk about our wingman ministry, our small groups, we have two criteria. Keep it biblically centered, theologically centered, and do a work in the community. Give back. That's one of the things that binds men together when we work with our hands to do things. But it's also an aspect of living out your faith. And I don't care what you do, whether it's prison ministry or whether it's uh, workspace projects, find a passion that you're passionate about and do it. But do it with purity of, of motivation and heart, because that's truly what um, you know, I firmly believe is, is that aspect of living like of, of excellence is all about. I think that's it. It's doing it from the heart is what makes it absolutely real, is when you do something from the heart. If you do it for ulterior motives, like you said, I went to the food bank, take a picture of me. So it's because we live in this selfie world now, the selfie society. You know, who cares? Just go do it. I tell a story. Um, about, uh, you remember who uh, Jesse Owens is, of course, right? Because I know you're a history buff. And, uh, but do you ever, you know who Ralph Metcalf is? No. He took second at the Olympics in 1936. And while he didn't make history, he went on in his life to build a legacy. He left a legacy. And he's had two federal buildings named in his honor. And I'll tell you the story one time, sometime when we get together because it's, it's a lot longer than we have here for on the podcast. But what's important, that's the question I, that I always ask my audiences when I speak, is what's important, making history or leaving a legacy? And I think you nailed it, dude, is, yeah, you made some history. You're in, you're in the history books, right? You're there, a couple Super Bowls, you've been. But what's going to be Chad's legacy? And I think if we look at that as men, as women, as business leaders, and we think about what our legacy is, that's the thing that lasts. Amen. You know, one of the biblical proverbs, too, that I subscribe to from day one was, let another praise you not to your own mouth a stranger and not your own lips. So don't toot your own horn. You know, and this is what kind of drives me so nuts about social media, is just that, that people put up a facade that it's not their real lives. So what is your true motive as to why you do what you do? And that's where... If you do something and you realize, would it matter if nobody else knew that I was doing this, would I still do it? That's your passion. And that's cool. And that comes back to the, what we generally think of the, the uh, definition of integrity, too. Do the right thing even when no one's looking. Right. Amen. And it kind of all ties together. I love that. So, so talk about leadership skills, because this is a leadership podcast. And leadership skills are critical for success. So if you were to say there were three leadership skills that were critical for success, you could just boom, 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 and say what they are. I know there's a lot that are critical, but what are your top three that you think leaders need to master to be successful? Um, one is, again, number one, for anybody in any situation, that foundational principle truth that has to be settled first in your mind 
is identity, who you are, who do you choose to be, um, is, is key. If you don't have that, the decisions that you make are going to be fickle. It's going to be based upon whatever, whatever the direction the wind blows. And you'll be like a rudderless ship out at sea in the midst of a storm. So identity. First thing, second thing is from a group, it's, it's about others. It's not about you. It's about others. You as a leader, how can you lift up, edify, motivate, inspire your team to accomplish, thirdly, a greater goal? What's your mission statement? What is collectively binds you together core value wise to create something and to accomplish something that's, that's greater than self. And I firmly believe that if you sit there and your, your main objective or your main goal is, I'll just use revenue generation just to make money, to be profitable. It's not sustaining. What do you do when you hit those hard times when things are out of your control, a la coronavirus, where sure. your company's back against the wall, what do you do when you have been denied the ability to make money? You can still be a successful organization, motivating your people, because when the, uh, the spigot gate opens, when we get back to work, what are you going to do? I mean, if you have your people that are a team, that are focused, that are cohesive, that's what it's all about. And you're going to take off and be ready and hit the ground running. It's about the fundamentals, the X's and O's. And, and for me, those are the three things. That's see that you nailed it. By the way, was that a Navy reference I heard in there? You on your ship? Yeah. <laughs> that's well, a really joke, folks. Lost it, Steve. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, you're absolutely right. Is are you prepared? I think leaders need to be prepared, not just when we come out of this, which is absolutely critical right now, but also are you prepared for the future? Are you planning for the future? Are you looking for what those changes may come, what those opportunities are down there or those obstacles may be down the road for you. And that, that's, a, that's a great one. Thank you, you know, for sharing that. I appreciate yeah, it. So I'll just um, say this one that add thing onto that, you know, character is not character. Faith is not faith until it's tested, right? It's, it's easy to live life when it's affluence, everything's going well, but when it's tested, same thing with leadership, leadership is not true leadership until it's tested in some form or fashion until you have to overcome something. That's where you know, and that's where you truly own, am I a leader? Then you know. Uh, that's a great, a great concept. What a great idea. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, so mindset, quick, uh, what are some ideas that people can use to keep a good mindset? We're, like I said, we've, we've been talking about this, this COVID. Everything we're talking about is this locked in place, doing the, staying at home. Hell, I, I was talking to my neighbor. He got pulled over going from where I live to Louisville, and that's a town near for those that listen internationally, that we live close by, you got stopped at eight o'clock at night going to work. So how do you keep a good mindset? It was kind of strange, I thought so too, but how do you keep a good mindset, a positive mindset during these challenging times? What's some techniques or tactics that you use? You know, I'm, I've been a, a uh, I was mentored when I was a kid growing up by Dr. Dennis Whaley, the psychology of winning. He was one of the original oh, yeah. with Zig Ziglar back in the day. And one of the things that he always talked about was positive self-affirmations, positive self-talk, um, visualization. So that was one of the things that I have, you know, I, I established and it has become second nature to me, but I established habits of having certain I am statements. I am fill in the blank or I see myself fill in the blank, positive self-talk, because we all have a, a tape recorder in our minds that will repeat our experiences, our thought processes, and we have the ability to tape and to erase what is on that tape recorder. So if you fill your, this tape recorder in your mind, your, your id, ego, superego, whatever you, you want to get into the psychology That's aspect. way too smart for me, dude. Yeah. No, but what I'm saying is it, it matters what you ingest from a mental perspective matters. So during this time of crisis, what are you feeling? Are you constantly watching the news, constantly on your social media, getting to a place where you're in fear, fear of the unknown, fear of what has happened is potentially, potentially gonna happen with this virus or the economic downturn or whatever, which things that you have no control over, that's causing increased anxiety and that's not the correct mindset to have. So it's being self-aware who you are, identifying that, again, that identity piece, 
and then reinforcing it with those per certain positive self-talk affirmations. People think, man, that's a bunch of psychology, mumble jumble. I don't need it. But I'm telling you, it works. It works. And right, I you're absolutely a lot of right. my success to that early in life is because mentally, I made the commitment early on. You talk about wrestling. Chris, quick story, if you don't mind. My junior year, made to the state tournament, should have placed, should have potentially won. I got beat first round because mentally, first thing I thought of when I was walking out on the mat, looking around, I was intimidated. And I said, man, I'm going to get beat. Not quite the mental mindset you want to have when you're getting ready to go out to compete, right? So I made Correct. a commitment to myself that I was never going to be defeated mentally again. And that's where I really employed a lot of these techniques that I'm sharing positive self-talk, visualization, visualizing yourself, practice what you're going to go through, whether that can be an interview that you're going to get ready for or a, a business development meeting, flying jets in combat or playing in football. I visualize myself going through that. And man, that whole next year, I, I ended up winning the state tournament. I, I beat everybody. I either pinned them or beat them by eight points. It was all because of mindset. And, and for me, that was the big key that helped sustain me going on no matter what I did, whether that was playing football, classroom, flying jets, or in business, mindset matters. You know, that's, it's so interesting that you talk about that because one of the things that I advocate for my clients when I work and I do coaching clients is design those I am statements. Those we call them affirmations and design those. And my take on that is, two pieces. Number one, your brain doesn't know what's real and what's not real. When you tell it something, it believes it. That's kind of why guys run around in their boxers with a baseball bat when they hear a bump in the middle of the night, right? Because we, we make it real. We make that bump in the middle of the night as if someone's broken into the house. The other part is gigo, good in, good out. You should be garbage in, garbage out. It's an old programmer term, but if you put good in, you're going to get good out. And using affirmations absolutely positive. And that visualization absolutely positively works. I know it. I've got experiences with clients that, and everybody looks at me at the first time I ever bring up affirmations. They go, are you talking about Al Franken? I'm good enough. I'm smart enough. And doggone it. People <laughs> like me. Remember that from Saturday Night Live? Yeah. Yeah. Because everyone laughs at it, but you know why we make fun of things? Because they work. Because they're real. And that's one of the things. And I love that you do that. And Dennis Waitley, I know Dennis, I know of Dennis Waitley, never met him, but that's so cool that you were mentored by him early on. And what, what a blessing that was for you to be able to get that knowledge right there. So that's cool. So I want to be remiss and I want to make sure we're good on time. I know you're busy as you can be even during this time. So I've got a couple of things. Is there anything right now, number one, first, that you'd like to promote? You want to talk about anything that's coming up? Um, new stuff that's going on, a shout out, whatever it is. You know, I would say, Rick, something that you and I are both passionate about. We, throughout this interview, talked about men's ministry wingmen. So if, if you're male out there and you want to be part of a connected a group of guys that get together, that can be transparent, that can laugh, have a good time, but yet walk through life in a meaningful and impactful way, check out wingmen. Wingmen.org. Wingmen.org. And we have groups all North Texas and Atlanta right now, physical face-to-face -face groups, but we're getting together and doing virtual groups um, where there's no geographical limitations. You can be in Zimbabwe and be connected. So that's what I would like to push and to promote. And if you'd like to check out any of my books, you can go to my website, chadhennings.com. Oh, perfect. Thank you. And there's one other, and I'm going to throw in a plug for you and for something else that passionate you're passionate about is what's coming up, Promise Keepers. Yeah, you know, July we're getting 31st. ready to have July 31st at AT&T Stadium. So it, wherever you are in the country, wherever you are in the country, I highly recommend you look up Promise Keepers, promisekeepers.com, right? Or is it that org? Dot .org. org, promisekeepers.org. And we'll have a graphic up there that'll have it underneath. Uh, promisekeepers.org. And if you can get here in July, AT&T Stadium, um, I highly recommend it myself as well. So last but not least, I got three questions, three final quick questions for you, Chad. And these are what we call Coach Rick's bald truth questions, because this is going to uncover some stuff on you. So you get to hold a, a dinner party. You're holding a dinner party, and you get to invite – there's a dinner party for six. You get to invite five people. You're one of them, so you get to invite five people. And they could be anyone in all of history, alive or dead. Who do you invite and why? 
Uh, man, I think the first one, without getting to everybody's usual suspects, you know, Jesus, of course, but I would do St. Paul. St. Paul, because when it talked about an, an individual man who totally changed the world, because in the book of Acts, it talks about these men are from Judea, and, you know, they are here, and these men have turned the world upside down. To have that impact, what passion, okay. what purpose. St. Paul, second one, you know, from a leadership perspective, George Washington. And what I would say George Washington would be, this is a guy who had, if you've read his biography or read the, the, the stress, the trial and the turmoil that he went through of, of losing more battles than he won, but yet holding together a group of men to continue to fight against the world's largest and strongest military force known to mankind at that time, what he was able to accomplish, and then to walk away. His identity was that surely, King George said, surely this man will be king. But then he said, if this man does not become king and he walks away, he truly is the greatest man on the face of the earth. And he did. Um, another guy I mentioned earlier, his book, Search for Meaning, I'd like to speak with, would have spoke with Victor Frankl. Oh, yeah. Uh, man Search for Meaning, because this is a guy, a survivor of Auschwitz, who developed a form of psychotherapy called logotherapy that to have survived and gone through that and to come out with a purpose, a passion, and a meaning in life, that um, to me is, would be impactful. Fourth would probably be John Wayne. I'm a huge John Wayne fan. You talk about <laughs> like that, you know, he, maybe his, truly in his personal life, we're all feel that had, had good and bad, but from his belief system, you know, American nationalism, um, duty on our country, he, he would be it. Um, and then fifth, um, I would say that I would like to probably go back and I'm a huge uh, sociology, psychology fan, you know, speak to Aristotle. Oh, wow. Um, Very no, cool. no, 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 I take that back. I'll go back before him. Before Plato, I'd go back to Socrates. You know, this whole aspect of, of why. And he was a guy that really, you know, he was killed because he instilled with everybody to ask the questions about why. Why do you do what you do? And that's why, you know, the early Greeks in, in Athens took him out. So there's my five. Awesome. That's, and a great five. What a cool, cool dinner party that would be, right? <laughs> yeah, to say the least. <laughs> really cool. So, okay, so an article's being written about you after you're gone. You know, we all have an expiration date. That's just reality. But an article is being written about Chad after you're gone. Not what's in the article. What's the headline? What's the title? I would say Chad Hennings, he was loved. Awesome. And an excellent, excellent title. So finally, what do you do to wake, when you wake up in the morning and set yourself up for a good day for success? What do you do to set yourself up for success in the morning i'm a firm believer in first fruits that the first things that you do in the morning kind of set your whole tone so for me it's quiet time with god it's it's a bible study kind of focusing on importance uh, of that and um actor dr sandy chapman from the center for brain health has actually writes about this making your brain more productive if you haven't read that book rick i'd highly recommend it but he she talks about this time in your day, when you're hunting elephants, you don't want to be chasing rabbits down rabbit holes. So she always ah. talks about setting two things in your life every day to hunt elephants. So spend 15, 30 minutes, and that may be doing something creative, that may be doing some integrative, innovative thinking, or that, like okay. I said, that quiet time, something to stimulate the creativity of your, your mind and your brain. And then you can spend the rest of the day answering phone calls, you know, making calls, doing emails. Miscellaneous stuff, stuff, sure. So to keep my brain young, those are the two things. I, you know, two elephants that I hunt, quiet time, and then I try to think of a creative process or just have a creative thought, either that be thinking through something that I read in the paper, how does this apply to me and how can this translate to my life? Something along those lines, just to kind of spend some time getting the uh, creative, integrative, innovative, and juices flowing. Man, that's some great advice and some great direction for folks to try. So quiet time, folks, 
And Chad takes his quiet time with God and then uh, do something, eat, take a bite of that elephant in the morning, whatever that might be. Get those creative juices flowing. I love it. Good stuff. So, hey, brother, I appreciate you being on the, on the show. I appreciate you being on the podcast and uh, I appreciate you wholeheartedly. Um, and folks, this is, this is, this is a top line guy and I've been really blessed to know, know him and call him a friend as well. So I appreciate you being here. Thanks, Rick. Appreciate you. All right. Well, you've been listening to the bald truth and coach Rick of the peak performance group, the company that helps people and organizations reach their potential. If you're looking for a way to grow your organization, whether it be sales, leadership, or strategic planning, we can help you with the Peak Performance Group. Give us a call at 817-748-7425 or visit us at www.mypotentialplus.com and we will connect you with the right coach. My name is Coach Rick and that's The Bald Truth. 